All right, I need to talk about what is chapter 12 in the second edition, edition of the book. It's workers' compensation and employers' liability insurance. Now, employers' liability sounds a little strange um, because you say, well, how could an employer be liable um, that isn't covered under the CGL, right? Most of the time, employer liability is covered under the CGL. What we're talking about with employers' liability is really employee injury-related claims that won't fall under workers' compensation. So as an example, uh, and we'll talk more about this when we get into the second half of this, um, let's say we have somebody get hurt at work, and let's say they become permanently disabled. Okay, well, that's obviously a very serious loss. That's going to be a workers' compensation loss, because if you get hurt at work, the general rule is strict liability. The circumstances don't matter. The employer is responsible. So there's no suing. Uh, we just automatically say, no, uh, this is a workers' compensation injury, and we'll pay for all the medical care. There will be a disability benefit that's paid. Uh, any rehabilitation benefits that are necessary will be paid. And then uh, should the worst happen and an employee actually die, there's death benefits that can be paid under workers' comp as well. And that sounds pretty comprehensive. You say, well, what else could there be? Well, what if the spouse of that worker sues for loss of companionship? Um, what about services that that employee did at home? So uh, you lose the husband who did all the yard work, and now you got to pay somebody uh, to do the yard work that you formerly were getting done for free. Uh, that's a real economic loss, um, but it isn't going to be paid under workers' compensation because it's not uh, in one of those four categories. So we've got employer's liability insurance to help cover those kinds of losses too, and it belongs uh, in the same conversation as workers' compensation. Let me go ahead and make this a little bit bigger. There, look at that. It's beautiful. Um, let me make sure that everybody can see what we need to see. Um, okay, so the history of workers' compensation is kind of interesting. So before you had workers' comp, people got hurt on the job, and if they wanted to be compensated for that, they had to sue the employer and win. And the employer had all kinds of defenses available to them. Um, you know, the employer could say, look, uh, it's not our fault that you're clumsy and you fell and you fell into the meat grinder and you, you suffered a, ser a terrible injury. Uh, you can't hold us responsible for that. That's not our problem that you're clumsy. Um, and so it would be up to a court, up to a judge and a jury to figure out should the employer be held liable or not. Well, you can imagine all the problems that go along with that. Um, it takes a long time for that to get settled. And in the meantime, you have somebody who's out of work, they're not earning an income, and they also have medical expenses. So kind of a double whammy there. Not really fun to have to deal with that. Plus, from the employer side, there's a little bit of uncertainty. I mean, you, you want your employees to be thinking highly of you. And if when they get hurt, your first response is to say, hey, sue me in court if you want me to pay, that damages the employer-employee relationship. So that's not ideal. And so over time, uh, then we threw in another factor where, hey, employers didn't really have certainty. You know, what if a court comes back and holds you responsible for all kinds of costs that you weren't planning on paying? Um, and you're blindsided by that. And now you have these massive costs that you're going to have to pay. Uh, as And you had to pay all the expenses of going through a court settlement to figure this out. Um, maybe there's a better way. And so what we decided is let's shift this in the early 1900s. Let's shift this to no fault protection. In other words, we're not going to worry about whether or not the employer was actually liable. Um, we're, we're not going to argue about that. We're just going to say if it happened at work, uh, then we're going to say the employer is liable. Why would the employer deal with that? Why would the employer say, OK, I agree to that? Well, the trade was this. Workers' compensation was supposed to be the exclusive remedy. So you don't get to sue the employer for more. Um, you don't get to sue them for punitive damages. You don't get to sue them for excessive pain and suffering and things like that. Uh, that's not part of the workers' compensation piece. could be part of the employer's liability piece. We'll get to that. But workers' compensation was supposed to be the exclusive remedy. You get hurt on the job, uh, yep, the employer's going to pay. Um, and you go straight to there, and there's no arguing, and there's no fighting over who's responsible or how much it's supposed to be. And the idea was that'll make this a much more efficient system because we don't have to worry about the transactional costs of going to court. I mean, think about that. You've got lawyers on either side. That's expensive. Not to mention you've got a whole overhead cost of a court, 
right? I mean, you've got to pay court reporters and judges and, and bailiffs and, um, you know, that whole system by itself is expensive. If you could do away with all that, you'd have a lot more money available to give directly to injured people. So that was the theory that, you know what, this might actually be cheaper than keeping it as a liability system, even though a liability system meant you might be able to avoid some claims. Well, now you can't anymore. So we got more than 100 years of history of workers' compensation being the dominant model here. And this has been how it's been in the U.S. for a long time. Pretty much everybody who's employed is covered under workers' compensation. I say pretty much. We'll get to some of the exceptions later. What are the benefits? Well, uh, if you're hurt at work, there's going to be medical expenses, and you may not be able to work for a time while you heal. Uh, that's wage loss. Um, to get paid, it actually has to arise out of the course of employment. So one of the things I put directly under here, driving to and from work, that's not the course of employment. Um, so yeah, you have a car accident on your way to work and you say, well, if I didn't have this job, I wouldn't have been driving here and I wouldn't have been in this accident, therefore they should pay. That sounds like it's part of my work. Courts have decided it's not. Uh, so to and from work is not covered, but while you're on the clock, generally it is. It also has to be a loss that arises out of the course of employment. We've had some interesting cases. So um, the way I've been describing it is, oh, yeah, if it happens on the job, it's covered. That's not technically true. Um, it, it does have to be related to the employment. So um, the case that the textbook mentions, a spouse came on the work property and murdered their spouse at work. Is that a work comp claim? Um, and they said, no, that, that doesn't really arise out of the course of employment. Um, another case that I'm familiar with with a company that happened in Indiana, they had a worker who died of a heart attack at his desk and uh, he was just doing regular work. So they said, no, that sounds like some type of underlying medical condition. That's not work related. We don't think this should be a work comp claim. And the court upheld that. Now, if you were digging a ditch and you died as a result of a heart attack, that sounds more likely to be have arisen out of the course of employment probably would be covered. One of the tricky things about work comp is you might be being exposed to some dangerous things without really knowing. Um, asbestos is the commonly given example. We know now, but for a long time, we didn't realize how dangerous that was. And so you had a whole bunch of claims being made on behalf of sick people, really sick people, um, trying to get employers to be held responsible for these claims when the employers had no idea that this was dangerous. Um, a lot of companies went out of business, a lot of settlements. A lot of problems uh, with asbestos, um, and that's one of the uh, inherent risks that's hard to get rid of. There could be some exposure out there that's undetected. I'll tell you what's really interesting this time of year is going to be the COVID claims, right? Because you're going to claim if you get it, oh, yeah, I was exposed to it at work. Now, if you're a doctor or a nurse, that's going to be easy to sell. Um, but if you're just around other people at work, uh, that's going to be a really difficult thing to prove that that arose out of the course of employment. We haven't seen a whole lot of cases yet, but I promise you that's coming. Um, and that's going to be something that from an academic perspective is fascinating to watch. Um, obviously, for the people who it really impacts, it's, it's a terrible thing and we wish it didn't happen. Uh, but if you're interested in insurance coverage and how it's supposed to work, man, that's going to make for a really, really interesting example of this idea of did that arise out of the course of employment or not. And the burden of proof is likely going to be on the insured to prove that it did. Um, and whoever's got the burden of proof is probably going to lose uh, because I think this is going to be something that'll be insanely difficult to prove. That's a guess. It's an opinion. We'll have to see. Um, but most of the time when you run into a situation where you have widespread losses, uh, there's usually political um, response to try to address those. Uh, so it wouldn't surprise me if some um, laws in some states get passed to just flat out say, yeah, people who get COVID, we're going to make that part of the workers' comp claim uh, for the medical side of it and the lost wages side of it, because uh, maybe that's the easiest place to fit it in. Uh, we'll have to see. Here's what you get if you're hurt on the job, unlimited medical benefits, whatever it takes to make you better, we're going to pay for um, disability benefits. So that's the idea that you can't work. And so it's an income replacement kind of thing. Uh, there will be some limits on that. 
And those are going to vary by state. The workers' compensation system is a state-to-state -state system, and every state is potentially a little bit different, particularly when it comes to limits. Rehabilitation benefits. So the idea is, can we get you back to work quicker? Those, usually the thought is, we should do this because that saves the system money. If you don't pay for rehab, it takes longer for the person to get back to work, and that means you're paying more out in disability. So you're better off paying for the rehab. You're saving money overall, and it's just a better thing for society in general. People want to get back to their jobs. Nobody, The average person doesn't want to sit around unable to work. Uh, most people would not choose that. Um, so you're helping them. You're helping the system save money. Uh, it makes sense to pay for rehabilitation benefits. So maybe that's you know physical therapy to speed up your recovery from an injury. Maybe it's something like um, you've been severely disabled and we can make some modifications to a vehicle to help transition you back to light duty work. Um, that's something that might qualify. Some insurers would say, yeah, that's a rehabilitation benefit. We'll pay for that. Death benefits are going to be different from state to state. Um, so death benefits usually, now think about this, we're not paying, we'll have a, a lump sum payment for the funeral expenses. There will be a lump sum payment in all states for that. But beyond that, uh, this is a benefit that goes to dependents. So if you don't have any dependents, if you're a single person and you die on the job, we'll pay for your funeral expenses and that's it. Um, if you have a spouse and children, different story. Now we're going to be able to pay them something. And this is all, you know, usually two thirds of salary tends to be uh, what you get paid. Same as disability, two thirds of salary. It's just with death, with disability, we pay until you're back to work. With death, you're not coming back to work. So some states will pay that benefit up until the spouse reaches age 65 um, when they say it would have been normal retirement age. Some states will pay that death benefit for life. Some states will put more restrictions on that death benefit, like in Indiana, 10 years. Um, if somebody dies, the spouse and uh, children can get benefits for 10 years and that's it. Um, also, those death benefits will stop if you remarry. So guess what happens when people lose somebody in a work-related accident in Indiana? Yeah, they don't remarry for 10 years, right? Because that's the set. Why would you? That's foolish, right? You're, you're just going to lose the benefit that you're legally entitled to. Um, and when you make stupid laws, uh, forgive me for classifying that law as stupid, uh, but if you don't want people to behave that way, then, then make a law that doesn't depend, put a time limit on it like that. People respond to incentives, right? Economics 101, this shouldn't be surprising. And this is what happens. Um, so people will make serious life decisions and alter them and change them and delay them because of the presence of a law that says, hey, you get uh, benefits for 10 years, but they stop if you remarry. Okay, well, it's real easy to prevent that then. Uh, if I want the benefits to continue, I just figure out a living situation that doesn't require legal marriage. Um, and that's what people do. And again, nobody should be surprised by that at all. Okay, when we specifically talk about disability benefits, we have a bunch of different kind of disability benefits. The easiest one to imagine is the rarest one, which is permanent total disability, right? Okay, so you're disabled. You are never going to be able to work again at all. That's what people imagine when they think about disability. Uh, but that's not the majority of disabilities. Now, that can happen. And when it does, uh, that means that we're going to have a long period of time that we're going to be paying benefits for. And usually these disability income benefits, if they're total disability, um, usually you're looking at two thirds of salary, right? So permanent total disability is really an awful financial outcome because you're going to get two thirds of your salary replaced, but that's two thirds of your salary. You're going to take a step down in standard of living. There are some tax benefits if you're permanently and totally disabled, uh, but in general, if we have to swap your income for a disability income, um, that that is not going to be a financially uh, positive decision for the family. That usually causes problems. Um, the other one that could happen is temporary total disability. So, yeah, I can't work at all. Maybe I broke my leg and maybe I load trucks in a warehouse. Probably can't do that job with a broken leg. Um, so, yep, I'm totally disabled can't work, but at some point that broken leg is going to heal. I can go back to my job. So maybe I'm out of work for 12 weeks. Um, and they know, they know if you break a leg, uh, they have long history of paying claims. They know about how long it's going to take you to recover within, you know, a week or two, they can predict that. Um, and that would be an example of a temporary total disability. So there you'll get two thirds of your salary 
until you can get back to work. You know, maybe that's 10 weeks, maybe it's 12 weeks, maybe it's 13 weeks, starts to get to 20, 25 weeks, 26 weeks, then they're going to start to do some investigating. And interestingly enough, they might send out a private investigator to observe you as you live your daily life. Um, when you're in public, you can be filmed. Um, that's not a privacy violation if you're out in public. Um, and so private investigators will do that and they'll find out, you know, hey, is, is this guy really having trouble getting around? Is he seriously recovering? Or is he trying to maximize his disability payments? And if they find out that you're going dancing every Friday night, um, that's something that's going to be followed up on. And it usually results in the, in the cessation of disability payments. And then the company will try to seek back payments that it's already made. Um, those are unusual situations. You know, 95% of the time people are trying to get back to work. They're not playing games with this. The other 5% of the time um, makes for really interesting stories. Uh, but doesn't happen very often. Partial disabilities are a little bit tougher. So temporary partial disability. So, okay, same situation. I'm loading trucks. I break my leg. Maybe they say, all right, you were normally loading trucks for 40 hours a week and you can't do that, but we do need some help with dispatch for 10 hours a week. And that's phone work. You can do that. Um, all right. Then my disability is actually, actually partial, right? Um, I can only work 10 hours a week. Uh, so I'm losing three quarters of my income, but it's not my entire income. It's not a total disability. So uh, what will happen there is they'll replace two thirds of the difference. What did you lose? Um, it's sometimes possible to end up with a permanent partial disability. So um, I break my arm and the arm never works the same way again. I don't have full rotation or full flexing uh, of the wrist, something like that. Well, we have ways to pay for that where we say, all right, you are permanently disabled. Um, you can still work, but there is a situation where we're going to have to compensate you something. And a lot of times these are compensated as lump sums. Um, and so they might say, all right, looks to me like you've got a 2% permanent partial disability. And that's kind of arbitrary. Uh, but over time, we've developed compensation methods that, that seem to make sense. So maybe if you couldn't, if you didn't have full a use of a wrist, they might say, okay, yeah, you're entitled to a 2% or a 5% permanent partial disability. Then they'll look at 5% of your salary and that's what you'll get paid. Um, that, and that's a settlement um, for a permanent partial disability that can be negotiated. Um, and if that happens to you, it might be worth having a lawyer uh, be on your side here uh, because that's worth something to have somebody who knows what they're doing uh, argue this for you in court. It's hard to do that on your own. That's another example of a disability income benefit. All of these are disability income benefits. Um, and because of that, we usually have a deductible. So there will be a, a short waiting period that you have to fulfill before you start to collect benefits. A lot of times it's seven days uh, or one week, one business week. Um, sometimes we have scheduled benefits. So yeah, if you lose a finger at work, they might pay you $20,000. Uh, you lose your dominant hand at work, they might pay you $200,000. Um, that number is actually probably a little high. Uh, the payments on the scheduled benefits for disability generally tend to be low. In your employee benefits class, you probably talked about um, accidental death and dismemberment. This is the dismemberment piece. Um, it's just that here, we're talking about it happening under uh, work-related conditions. So if you lose the sight of both eyes, that generally it will give you a full benefit. So that'll give you your full benefit just as if you had died. I said it might be a $500,000 benefit. It'll be scheduled. It'll be on a list. It'll say if these horrible injuries happen, this is how much we pay. Um, and it's a little macabre, but it's interesting. Um, that's for sure. On the benefit side, okay, once you have an injury, you got to let the employer know. The employer has to let the insurance company know. The insurance company has to let an agency know. Uh, so in every state, we have a workers' compensation administration agency. We've got a lot of different people who are involved in this process. So that's kind of messy, uh, kind of expensive. Um, they're usually settled by an agreement. So if you're the injured worker, you've got interests here that you've got to make sure are handled. Now, if it's a simple injury, you know, um, we've had a number of these that have happened at our hardware stores. We had somebody cut themselves while they were trying to cut a key. Um, and that key cutting machine cuts really deep. So the, it was a, a, a small cut, but it went all the way to the bone. He had to go to the emergency room, get that stitched up. No complications. It healed. He, he didn't lose any time at work. 
Um, all we had to do was pay his medical expenses. And that was enough. He said, yeah, that's all I want. Um, I'm not permanently disabled by this. I just, if you pay for my medical expenses, that was the only problem. Boom. No, no issue. Sometimes it's, it's harder than that. Sometimes if we're talking about a permanent partial disability, uh, it's hard to argue what that's actually worth. Um, those benefits are going to begin immediately. Um, now, if an employer contests the claim, that's rare. Remember that workers' compensation, if somebody gets hurt on the job, in general, the rule is the employer is liable. Uh, but if the employer thinks there's some reason they shouldn't be liable, they can contest the claim, and then there will be a hearing that the agency conducts. Um, so there will be usually retired judge, judges, that's really common, um, people who have familiarity in this area have heard all kinds of cases before, uh, can make a determination about whether or not this ought to be a claim. It's a little bit like unemployment. I know I'm off topic here, but if somebody files an unemployment claim and you claim that they were fired for cause, and that means you shouldn't have to pay them, it, it, there's going to be a hearing and each side tells their story and the administrative board has to make a ruling about whether or not this is eligible for a claim. Okay, that's a good place to take a pause here. We'll pick up on the next lecture from this slide. Thanks a lot, you guys. Questions, send them my way by email and I'll do my best to respond.